yes uh, we finished the wisdom books yesterday so today we are starting on the prophetic books there are actually 17 books of prophecy in the old testament and the first five are called the major prophetic books only because they are lengthy you know there are many many chapters and so they are called major and the rest are uh, the 12 the 12 remaining are called minor prophetic books so it does not mean that the major prophetic books are in some way more important than the others it's just because of the length of the books that the uh, first prophetic books are called major prophetic books and all the other 12 which come after that are smaller they have very few chapters in them so they are called the 12 minor prophetic books so we would be looking at them um, one after the other today we will use the entire class just for isaiah but next time onwards we would probably have to do two two books to be able to finish so um, starting off with isaiah isaiah is someone who did his prophesying before the um, babylonian captivity okay so he was prophesying to the nation of judah he was um, giving them uh, the prophecies of god about how one day judah will be punished uh, so those are mainly the prophecies that we see. He also does address even the northern kingdom to some extent. Um, and uh, so his ministry begins sometime around 740 BC uh, at the time of Uzziah's death. Okay, So that's basically when he begins his ministry, his prophetic ministry. And... He speaks, he continues his work of prophesying for around 40 to 50 years. So uh, during the reign of uh, Jotham and Ahaz and Hezekiah, he is the one who is doing the prophetic work. So during the reign of these three kings, you have Isaiah you know, having his prophetic ministry. Um, coming to the genre of this particular book, uh, we have one section which deals with history. That would be chapters 36 to 39, where it talks about um, the encounter which, which Hezekiah has with the commander of Sennacherib, the Assyrian king. So that happens in chapters 36 to 39. So that portion is a narrative history, but the rest of it is all prophetic you know, oracles. The rest of it is all prophecy. And you have one parable also included, which actually would be chapter 5. I don't think we'll have time to look at that. But then later, you can just go to chapter 5 and look at the little parable about the vineyard, which is mentioned in uh, over there. So you have basically three genres being seen in the book of Isaiah. You have narrative history. You have a whole bunch of prophecies. And you also have one parable. Who are the key personalities? Obviously, Isaiah is the key personality. But then his sons are also can be called key personalities because their names are very significant. And we will make time and look at that. Um, coming to the structure of the book, chapters 1 to 39 is generally regarded as one independent section because it mainly talks about the prophecies of judgment which uh, God wishes to convey both to the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. So the first 39 chapters are mainly prophecies of judgment, which the Lord is speaking out. Um, and um, we see this uh, during, the, during the lifetime of Isaiah while he is still alive. In 722 BC is when uh, God's judgment against the northern kingdom is fulfilled. So Assyria comes and attacks and the people of northern israel are taken away as captives so that occurs during the lifetime of isaiah itself but as for the southern kingdom about 100 years after the death of isaiah that is when those the you know prophecies of judgment against the southern kingdom they are fulfilled about 100 years after his death so all the prophecies that god speaks against these two uh, kingdoms the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom all of them come to pass just as god had prophesied the next major section uh, would be chapters 40 to 55 
where it mainly talks about how uh, the people will one day come back from exile. God will have mercy upon them. They will be restored once again. So um, while the first 39 chapters uh, are condemning the people and you know warning them of judgment, there's more comfort uh, given in the uh, second section, which is 40 to 55, where it talks about uh, the return of the people and how they will be restored. And there are words of hope spoken over here. The last section would be chapters 56 to 66, where it talks about the kingdom which will come later in the future, in the end times, when you will have a new heaven and a new earth. So those things are explained in the last portion. And um, what Isaiah is hoping to convey is that, you know, even though the nation is going to go through some very, very difficult times, in the end, those who have stood by the Lord, those who have remained faithful, there will be a great reward for them. And as for the ones who have been wicked, who have persecuted the nation, who have persecuted the people of God, there would be a great judgment against them. So uh, it talks about how there would be judgment upon the evil and um, there would be a reward for those who have remained faithful. So these things are mentioned in the last section, uh, 56 to 66. Now, coming to the author, um, you know, it's mentioned in, very, in, in many parts of the Old Testament and also in the New Testament that uh, Isaiah is the author of this particular book. So there are no doubts about that. Um, but generally, it is said that chapters 1 to 39, he would have written during the first portion of his ministry, um, you know, where he's giving out all the words of judgment. And then later on, uh, maybe in the 600s is when he would have written the uh, chapters 40 to 66. So the first section was probably written during the early years of his prophetic ministry. But the other chapters, chapters 40 to 66, were probably written around 681 BC or so. And it's generally believed that based on the way he has written the book of Isaiah, the words that he has used, uh, his writing style, they say that he was most probably a very educated man, which means he probably belonged to one of the aristocratic families. He was somebody um, from a rich family, from a good background. And in fact, they say that he probably had connections with the royal court. He would have known personally many people who belonged to the royal palace, the main uh, you know, nobles and aristocrats. He probably would have known them personally. However, he was not very well liked by the people in the royal court because he was always saying that the people of Israel should not make you know, partnerships. They should not make alliances with other nations. They should instead just trust God. Now, this was a very um, critical time for the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom because around this time when when Isaiah, you know, uh, started his ministry, at that time, uh, Assyria had become very, very powerful. Uh, Tiglath Pileser III was the king. And this man was just going from nation to nation, you know, um, waging one war after another, winning all the wars because he had this uh, really superior army. Uh, and they were really efficient. They had come up with some new battle strategies on how to fight. And they were very, very violent and uh, had no sense of mercy. So they were very powerful and people were very scared of them. And so in the entire northeastern region, all the nations over there began to form partnerships. Because the idea is that if Assyria comes and attacks one of them, they can all together join their armies and fight back. So they all were making political partnerships with one another. And here was Isaiah saying, no, 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 don't make a partnership with anyone. Just trust God. If Assyria comes and attacks, the Lord will help. And this is not something that the royal court was willing to accept. They too wanted to make alliances with other nations, you know, so that they can protect themselves. And they did not want to trust in the Lord. So uh, he, Isaiah was not very well liked by those who were in power. Um, during this time, when Isaiah was having his ministry, around that time, you also have Hosea, Micah, and Nahum also serving as prophets. So that's basically the time period. Uh, 
during the lifetime of Isaiah, you also have Hosea, Micah, and Nahum doing their respective ministries. Uh, another interesting fact about Isaiah is that his wife was also a prophet. So both of them had a prophetic ministry. Both husband and wife had a prophetic ministry. And it's also generally believed, Jewish tradition generally says that it was Manasseh who uh, cut uh, Isaiah into two pieces. Uh, you know, because Manasseh was a very violent man. Uh, he was the one who took many of his children and you know offered them as human sacrifices to the pagan gods. Uh, so they say that he was the one who actually uh, cut Isaiah into two pieces. Uh, now, we don't know whether that actually happened or not, but at least that's what Jewish tradition says. Isaiah is also called the evangelical prophet. Uh, this New Testament word is used for him. He's called the evangelical prophet because of the number of messianic prophecies which he uh, you know, uh, gives. So a lot of prophecies he gives on the Messiah. So these are just, just some basic facts about uh, Isaiah. Now, um, one particular issue that we will have to deal with whenever we want to talk about the book of Isaiah uh, is about the authorship. There are some people who say, no, 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 Isaiah did not write all of the entire book of Isaiah. He only wrote the first section. According to them, they say he wrote only chapters 1 to 39. The rest of it must have been written by somebody else is something that you will see a lot of scholars saying. Why do they say that? They have a huge problem with two verses. Because of those two verses, they go on and on coming up with a whole bunch of theories about how other people wrote and how the writing style is different in the first portion, the writing style is different in the other portion. They talk about all kinds of things simply because they, have, they find it so difficult to absorb those two basic verses. Let's actually read them out. Uh, Isaiah 44, verse 28, if someone could read out for us, please. Isaiah 44, 28. Yes. So here um, in this verse, God talks about how he's going to use someone named Cyrus as his shepherd to do his purposes. Okay. So it's what God says over here. And then again, in the next verse, which is actually chapter 45, verse 1, uh, he again mentions him. What does it say over there? If someone could read out 45, 1. Mm. Mm. Yes. So again, over here in this verse, God very specifically mentions Cyrus by name. And he says, I am going to anoint this man and use him as my weapon to bring judgment upon a whole bunch of uh, nations. So in these two places, uh, very specifically, God mentions Cyrus by name. And the main problem was that when these verses were written out, Cyrus had not even been born. His parents had uh, not even been born so because this happened 200 years later. So the scholars say, how could Isaiah know 200 years earlier itself that such a man, uh, Cyrus, will one, one day come upon the earth and that he will become a great conqueror and he will be able to fight? No, no, no. So this portion, you know, chapter 40 onwards must have been written by somebody at the, you know, when the people come back from exile when all the exiles return back to Jerusalem, you know, Cyrus gives the order saying, you can all go back to your nations. So at that time, when all the people came back to their respective kingdoms, at that time, somebody must have sat down and written down chapters 40 onwards up to chapter 66 is the theory they come up with because they cannot believe that uh, Isaiah could have given a prophecy about someone who did not even exist and how he could possibly know his name exactly and tell from which nation he is going to be king and all of those details. Uh, so 
because uh, chapter 40 onwards it talks about how one day god will bring back his people he will restore the land and all of that so they say how could isaiah know all of those things that much in advance so just because of that a lot of people they say up to 39 definitely isaiah wrote it but chapter 40 onwards somebody else must have written it is what they say but then there's a lot of proof in the book of isaiah itself and in the bible which disproves this rather silly theory okay so uh, there are in fact some people um okay what the the term they use is diotero isaiah the second isaiah the word diotero is basically means second so they say somebody they don't know the name of the person but they say somebody a second person who know, called himself isaiah would have written chapters 40 to 55 and maybe because the last portion, you know, 56 to 66 is, is talking about a new theme. It's talking about the new heaven and the new earth. So maybe a third man, a Trito Isaiah must have written that last portion. So it's rather sad that scholars who are dealing with the Bible are unable to believe the Bible. It kind of makes you wonder what is, you know, motivating them and guiding their knowledge they seem to be functioning purely at a human level with absolutely no uh, you know seeking from the lord otherwise the lord would reveal to them that he's quite capable of giving prophecies is quite capable of talking about future events so uh, they have a huge problem accepting that and so sometimes when you're going through the commentaries you'll see this term diotero isaiah and trito isaiah when you look at those terms you know you just wave your hand and say okay these poor people didn't know anything okay so it is basically Isaiah himself who wrote the entire 66 chapters. For example, we'll, let's look at some evidence. Okay, um, If someone could read out Isaiah 62 verse 6. If you notice, Isaiah 6, chapter 62 is somewhere at the end of the book of Isaiah. So, but the author who is writing these words, he writes like as if the walls of Jerusalem are nicely standing strong and nothing as bad as ever happened to these walls. Okay, so he says, I have posted watchman on your walls, Jerusalem. But what do we know about from, from history? After they come back, when the exiles come back home, for 85 years, they don't even have guts to rebuild those walls. The walls are just sitting over there. I mean, the, the entire city is just sitting over there in a broken down condition until Nehemiah comes along and then the walls are rebuilt. But here, this writer is writing about the walls of Jerusalem like as if they've always been standing. So it is very much Isaiah himself who is writing these words. Even this last portion, Isaiah chapter 62, is written by Isaiah and he's talking like as if the walls are still very much up there standing. Why? Because it is not some person who came later on who wrote that. It is Isaiah himself who wrote even the last portion. Another uh, uh, you know, piece of evidence that we can look at, if someone could read out Zephaniah chapter 2 verse 15. Zephaniah 2.15. Okay, so Zephaniah is a prophet who lived during the uh, kingship of Josiah. If you remember when we went through the historical books, Josiah was one of those very, very faithful kings who never strayed away from the Lord. And so his um, during his reign, uh, the Jerusalem was in a very prosperous condition. The, the entire nation was doing really well during his time because that man was really dedicated and committed to the, uh, to the Lord. So Zephaniah was prophet during those times. And this is what Zephaniah, you know, prophesies regarding the future of Jerusalem. And he says, you know, he's, he's talking like as if Jerusalem is a lady. And he says, she, that is Jerusalem, said to herself, 
I am the one and there is none besides me. I know I'm, I'm, I'm untouchable. Nobody can harm me. Nobody can do anything to me. That was the kind of pride uh, which Jerusalem had. And uh, he goes on to say, what a ruin she has become. She has become like a lair for wild beasts. You know, Now, once upon a time, human beings were living here. And now we have wild animals roaming around because the entire city is so broken down. So he talks about how one day judgment will come upon Jerusalem and it will be destroyed. And when he, you know, when he quotes these words of Jerusalem saying, I am the one and there is none besides me, those are the exact wordings which even Isaiah uses when he is giving his prophecy. That would be Isaiah chapter 47, verse 10, where he is also giving a word of prophecy. And he says, you know, about Jerusalem, he says, when you say to yourself, I am and there is none besides me. So both Zephaniah and Isaiah uh, are talking about the future of Jerusalem and they're using the same wording. So if we are going to pretend that Isaiah 47 was written by a different man much later on, after the exiles came back, you know, so should we say that even Zephaniah was also living at that time much later? Uh, it doesn't make any sense. You see, when you look at the historical records, you know the approximate timeline of each prophet. So Zephaniah most definitely was alive during Josiah's time. He was not someone who lived much later. And he uses a quotation which is taken from Isaiah. Whatever Isaiah has written, he's quoting that same wording in his work. So all these things were written much before they even went into captivity, even before the Babylonians came and captured Judah, these things were already written down. You, it was not some stranger who wrote down chapter 40 onwards much later in the future. Another interesting thing that we see uh, is found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, many of these Dead Sea Scrolls were you know, copies of the Old Testament, which were handwritten and stored in, you know, in large jars. And um, they were maybe written about 200 uh, to 300 years before the coming of Jesus. Okay, So about 200 to 300 years before Jesus came, uh, someone had very patiently sat down. The Qumran community had patiently sat down and written down. They had made copies, handwritten copies of all the scrolls. And so when they, uh, they made a copy of uh, the book of Isaiah also. And when you look at that particular scroll, um, they are writing chapter 39. And then once they finish chapter 39, immediately in the next line itself, they begin chapter 40. They don't even use a new column to write down chapter 40 because in their mind, they're basically writing the writings of one single man. This, it's a continuous piece of work. They don't leave any gap between 39 and 40 because you know, they who lived about 300 years before the coming of Jesus, they were very much aware that one single person had written this whole thing. So they don't even leave a gap between 39 and 40. They just write it as one continuous text. So it's these modern scholars who are unable to believe that, uh, that God could know the name of Cyrus. And so they are coming up with silly theories, which, you know, don't really uh, deserve much credit. Um, another piece of evidence. In the New Testament also, when John is writing and he mentions Isaiah, he takes two portions of Isaiah and he, you know, talks about it. So maybe we can actually just look at this passage. Um, uh, John chapter 12, if someone could read out, verses 38 to 41. John 12, 38 to 41. Yeah, uh, and then it says in 41, Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. So here, if you look at John chapter 12, uh, John mentions Isaiah three times. In uh, verse 38, he says, this was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet. And then verse 39, again, he mentions the same thing. He says, because as Isaiah says elsewhere, he doesn't say in verse 39, you know, a different Isaiah. 
no, not the first Isaiah whom I talked about in the earlier verse, but a different Isaiah said, he doesn't say that. He's just talking about the same Isaiah. And again in 41, he says, Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory. That He's talking about one single Isaiah. He's not talking about two or three different Isaiahs at all. And the interesting thing is that if you look at uh, verse 38, that is taken from the last portion of the book of Isaiah. The quotation that he has made over here, Lord, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? That is a um, quotation taken from Isaiah 53, the last portion, Isaiah 53, 1. But the next portion, for this reason, they could not believe because as Isaiah says elsewhere, so what he says elsewhere, that is taken from the beginning of the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. So he's taking uh, quotations from different portions of Isaiah, and he is under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He's completely convinced that one single person has written all of this. Okay, so uh, based on all of this evidence, uh, and of course there are many, many other, you know, uh, pieces of evidence, but just based on these basic facts, we would have to accept that one single Isaiah has written the entire book. Okay, so um, Isaiah is considered, uh, the book of Isaiah is the most quoted book in the New Testament. Most of the Old Testament quotations that we find, it comes from the book of Isaiah and also from uh, Psalms. So the most of the quotations we find in the, in the New Testament are basically from Isaiah and Psalms. Um, and then chapters 7 to 12, Isaiah 7 to 12, are called by some people as the book of Emmanuel. Because in chapter 7 to 12, you have a series of prophecies about the Messiah. So it's called the book of Emmanuel. Um, Isaiah is also the book in which you have a record of how Lucifer fell down. You know, he who was an angel, um, he turns into the devil, his own fault. He does that to himself. Um, then we have chapter 53, Isaiah 53, which talks about how, uh, you know, the suffering servant who will come on behalf of the people, he will be punished for our sins. Uh, so he, uh, so that very famous prophecy is found in Isaiah chapter 53. And that, according to your textbook, it says that as chapter 53 of Isaiah has been qu quoted 85 times. That I don't really know, okay? It just sounds like a very large number. So where are these 85 quotations, references found? I have no clue. So I don't know. I'll just take that with a pinch of salt. Not very sure that's that's correct or wrong, but maybe it's correct. Or maybe it could be a printing mistake. So I don't know. Um, yeah. Uh, coming to the names of Isaiah's two sons. And there's a lot of story behind it. Okay, so we will... Um, look at that. So um, I think this is an important section which we would need to know. So we are going to be talking about the names of Isaiah's sons, but in the process we will also be talking about a lot of historical events which took place and the prophecies which were spoken, all of that. Okay, So I think that will probably take up the rest of our time. Um, so when we look at the book of Isaiah and the way it begins, right in chapter 1, God begins with a prophecy of judgment. He talks about how one day he's going to burn down, you know, uh, Judah. So uh, Isaiah chapter one, verse seven. If you can, if someone could read out. Mm. Yeah. So he's talking about very serious judgment, which is going to come upon Judah. But in the very same chapter, if you look around the ending, the last few verses, there are also words of hope being given. For instance, we can maybe read out verses 25 and 26, if someone could read out. First chapter itself.
okay so even though god is speaking about very strong punishment which is going to come upon judah he also offers words of comfort he says a day will come when i will take you through this really terrible time of punishment and then you will be refined all that dirt which is there inside you it will be removed and you will become polished like silver and then i will bring you back to your land you will be restored you will have leaders once again so these are the things uh, that god speaks so even though god speaks judgment he also speaks hope he speaks about restoration in the future which is why god advises instructs isaiah to name his son um shear yashu okay so uh, you will actually find that in chapter 7 later on but that is basically the name okay shear yashu is a hebrew term which basically means a remnant shall return the word remnant basically means a small portion of the people so a small portion of the people will return so even as isaiah goes on speaking one word of judgment after another the people every time they look at that little you know little child growing up they would be reminded yes god's judgment is going to come down upon us but there is also hope because one day a remnant a small portion will come back to the land god will build us up once again so even though god is so harsh in the words that he speaks he places this little boy like a kind of example uh, a reminder to the people and so everyone you know someone calls out you know you know shear yashub come 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 here come have your dinner you know all the people will be reminded oh okay shear yashub one day one day god will again bring his people back so it's a very practical very real reminder to all the people and so he names his son shear yashub a remnant a small portion of the people will return so around this time in uh, 735 bc you know when uh, this tiglath pileser the third is going around fighting wars everywhere and you know defeating the people and taking gold and silver from them as tribute and is doing all of these things uh, you know while he is in that in that mood you have all these uh, nations coming together and forming political alliances to protect themselves so at that time uh the king of syria and the king of the northern kingdom they both decide let's come together and form a partnership so that if assyria attacks us you know our two armies can come together and we can fight why don't we ask even the southern king ahas to join us because then three armies can come together and we can fight this assyrian king so they come to ahas who is on the throne and they say you know why don't you join us in this uh partnership now ahas is kind of scared to join uh, because assyria is very powerful and he thinks oh no what if we get defeated then then uh, the assyrian king will be really angry with me and i'll really get into trouble so he's not very happy with the idea and he says no 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 i i think i don't want to join in the partnership okay so the king of assyria and the king of israel get really angry and they say look at this man he's refusing to join us and make a partnership with us let's go attack him let's see what is going to do you know two of our armies will go against him what we let's see what happens to him so ahas is really scared and terrified at this time and then you have the events of isaiah chapter 7 happening so isaiah is really scared that these two kings are now going to come you know against him to take revenge and at that time the lord speaks to isaiah and he says you know take your little boy take shear yashub along with you and go and meet ahas talk to him tell him that this is what god is saying and um um he says in verse 4 isaiah chapter 7 verse 4 god says do not lose heart because of these two smoldering stubs of firewood okay god calls these two kings the king of uh, syria and the king of israel he says you know don't be worried about them they are like two uh, pieces of wood you know you lit them with fire they burnt for a while now the fire has gone out you just have that uh, you know the uh, red sparks which are still flying but the fire is almost going out you know you notice right you burn a piece of wood and then when the flame goes out for a few minutes it continues to look red and it you know it's glowing nice and bright but it's just a smoldering stub of wood in a few minutes if you watch the red embers will die out 
and that's it. All you have is one uh, burnt up piece of wood. So God says these two kings are like that. So don't even worry about them. Don't even be afraid. I will be your strength. I will protect you and shield you from these two kings. It's the word of assurance that God gives Ahas. And then uh, um, he goes on to say in verse 8, in 65 years, you know, Ephraim, which is the northern kingdom, will not even be, a, be an independent people anymore. They'll be finished. So you don't even have anything to worry about from these two kings is the word which God gives to our hearts. You know, words of such comfort, such uh, encouraging, strengthening words. And just in case, you know, Ahaz is unable to believe such a beautiful promise, um, Isaiah says, you know, the Lord is saying, ask him for a sign and he will give you a sign that he will do this for you. And um, Ahaz says um, in verse 12, he says, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. God himself is saying, you know, ask for a sign and I will give it to you. And this man is like trying to sound very, very religious and he's saying, oh, no, no, pa. how can I ask? You know, how can I test God? I will not do that. But actually in his heart, he's already come up with an idea. And this idea is that if this Assyrian king comes and tries to, you know, attack me, I'll give him off all the gold and silver I have. Then he will leave me alone. So he's already come up with a plan inside. He doesn't want to trust in God. He doesn't want to rely on God. And so he says, no, 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 I don't want any sign. It's okay. It's all right. And then the Lord is really angry. And this is what Isaiah says in verse 13. He says, hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? You know, so then he says, whether you want a sign or not, you're going to be given a sign. And this is the sign which uh, Isaiah gives. And that is when you have verses 14 to 16 uh, being written out. If someone could read out Isaiah 7, verses 14 to 16. Yes. Uh, so here, um, God says, you know, um, the word used over there for virgin is the Hebrew word Alma. So he says, Alma basically means, uh, you know, young lady. So it, the Lord is saying, this is the sign which I'm going to give to you. A young lady will give birth to a child and that child's name will be Emmanuel, which basically means God is with us. God will be there to protect us, to strengthen us. We don't have anything to be afraid of. So a young lady will give birth to a child, and that child, child's name will be Emmanuel. Now, before this child is old enough to understand right and wrong, before this child is old enough to even be able to eat curds and honey, even before that itself, in that brief period of time, these two kings will be completely wiped out. So you don't have anything to be afraid of. Okay, is the word that God gives. Now, um, over here, it's basically talking about the second child which Isaiah is going to give, uh, you know, have. Uh, so the young lady mentioned over here uh, is the uh, prophet's wife, Isaiah's wife. So Isaiah's wife is going to give birth. Uh, to a child, and that child will actually be given the name Emmanuel. And uh, um, before that child is old enough, you know, in their days, they would give the mother's milk for about two years, three years, um, maybe around the age of two, two and a half. The, you know, they would start giving some curds and some honey to the baby. Uh, so, uh, what here uh, the Lord is saying is that before this little boy is even two years old, by that time, both of these two kings will be completely destroyed. So you don't have anything to worry about. No, God says he will take care. Now, this particular passage, later on when they were, you know, translating the Hebrew scrolls into the Greek language, and when they were translating this particular verse, God inspired the translators to use a particular word when they were doing the translation. 
here when you have in your isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 in the, the hebrew word which is used over here it just basically means young woman so alma can be a young woman who has got married and she has slept with a man or it could refer to a young woman who has never slept with a man it's just a, it's just talking about the age it's just talking about a young girl a young woman on the other hand when the translation was being done into the greek the greek septuagint was being created the, they don't use the just the general word for young woman they specifically use the greek word parthenos which literally means a virgin who has never slept with a man and later on when matthew talks about this verse you know in the new testament he also uses the same greek word parthenos which is which basically means a woman who has never got married so we see that this prophecy which God gives over here to Ahaz had two levels. The first level of the prophecy would happen in the lifetime of Isaiah itself because the child would be born and then the two kings would be destroyed. In 722 BC, uh, Assyria would come and you know wipe out uh, this um, northern Israel and then later on he would go to the king of Aram, you know, the Syrians. He would wipe out even the Syrian people. All of this will happen even before this little uh, child is two years old but there's another second level uh, layer to this prophecy which they don't realize at that point of time and then later when it is fulfilled in the new testament matthew says you know what the prophecy had two layers and the second layer is now fulfilled so uh, it is so interesting the translators could have just simply used any term for young woman but god inspired in such a way that, that they chose to use a word which would be scientifically ridiculous to use. You know, they would, it would have been better for them when they're doing the translation to, to have said a young lady who will give birth. But they chose to use that word virgin and say that the virgin will give birth. So God led events in such a way that they did this translation in that particular manner. So they, these events take place. Um, you know, Isaiah finishes giving the prophecy to Ahaz. He goes back. After he goes back, God says uh, to Isaiah, you know, I want you to take a large scroll and I want you to write down in big letters, I want you to write down one particular term on the scroll because this is a prophecy which I am giving. And uh, this is the word which God asks him to write down on the scroll uh, that you will find in your Isaiah chapter 8, verse 1. The word is Mahashalal Hashpas. Okay, that's the uh, Hebrew word that he says and so uh, isaiah calls uriah the prophet he calls zechariah and in their presence he writes down these this particular term on the large scroll what is the meaning of this it's like god is symbolically trying to convey a message god is saying you know what is written on this scroll is going to happen um the wording basically means this if you were to translate into English, it means speed, spoil, hasten, plunder. Okay, those are the four words. Speed, spoil, hasten, plunder. By spoil, it means the spoils of war. You know, when you go and fight a war with someone and you're able to get their gold, you're able to get their cattle, those are called the spoils of war. The word plunder also means basically the same thing. You're plundering that kingdom and you're taking all of their valuables from them. So if you were to translate it properly, it would be the, you know, Mahar Shalal Hashpas would basically mean go speedily to the spoils, go quickly to the plunder. So it's like God is giving permission and saying, go quickly and plunder these two places, the land of Syria and northern Israel. I am giving you permission to go ahead and do this. It's like as if God is giving permission to the Assyrian nation to come and destroy these two places go speedily and plunder them go quickly and take all the spoils of war from them is what god is saying and um definitely uh, yeah so shortly after this the both the kings you know the syrian king and the israelite king they come and they attack judah and ahaz has not turned to the lord he has not asked the Lord for protection. And so God allows many of the cities of Judah to be overrun. These two kings are able to you know, uh, wreak a lot of havoc. And um, in fact, they come and they lay a siege around the city of Jerusalem. So at that time, 
even then at that point of time ahas could have turned to the lord and say lord i am looking to you i i want you to help me but no he does not do that rather what does he do he takes money from the temple uh, he takes gold and silver from the temple and he takes gold and silver from his own treasury and he sends it to the assyrian king and says you know these two guys are attacking me you know i'm willing to come under your protection i'll start paying tribute to you so why don't you help me against these two kings so very very foolishly he goes and he places himself under the assyrian king because he thinks you know they will be able to protect me uh, which is actually a very foolish thing because god said you look to me and i can you know save your nation but that's a choice which ahas chooses not to make and um, shortly after this uh, you know uh, isaiah's wife gives birth to a, to the to the second son and um, god had told earlier that the name of this child would be emmanuel now a second name is given to this boy and the name that the boy is given is maharshalal hashpash hashpash yeah correct wow what a mouthful so that's the name which this boy is given because god is declaring is reminding and saying you know what i told right before this kid is 2 years old what i've prophesied is going to happen and it actually does come to take place just as god had said um so what happens to judah in the meantime now because of the foolishness of ahas now they are paying a very heavy tribute to the assyrian king and is the assyrian king very very grateful for all the money that is being given no 30 year 30 years later he comes to the doorstep of jerusalem and he puts a siege around them you know that's the commander of senna sherib's army the rabshaka is what it was the title which that man had so he comes he puts a siege around jerusalem about 30 years later and hezekiah is very very scared hezekiah does not behave like ahas he quickly goes to the lord and he says he kneels down and he says lord look at what has been done now lord you have to defend us we cannot do anything on our own you have to help us there's a big contrast in the way ahas behaved and the way hezekiah responds and because of the humility and trust with which hezekiah responds you know god changes events for them you know we already looked at this in uh, kings and we looked at it in chronicles the same story is mentioned in both the places and here you know you have more details being given so as you know um what happens is that um uh, yeah oh, god sends the ethiopian army to attack damascus the capital of syria so when this uh, commander the rabshaka when he hears about uh, the army big army which is coming towards damascus he immediately has to go back right and take care of that problem so he says to uh, to hezekiah you know you think i'm going away now but don't worry i'm coming back because which king has ever been able to stand against us our gods have defeated all the peoples and the same thing will happen to you so don't think that your god is extra special and he can do anything for you so he, with those words of warning the rabshaka goes quickly back you know to fight the ethiopian army which is coming towards their capital and in the meantime what does the angel of the lord do over here to all the soldiers who have camped around the angel of the lord comes at night kills the entire lot in the morning when they wake up not a single person alive they're all dead and what about sena sherib himself when he goes back to his uh, hometown to his palace his two sons murder him they assassinate him and uh, you know that's basically what happens so ahas could have seen miracles like that happen in his time if he had chosen to respond to the words of comfort and encouragement which god brought but ahas chose not to believe on the other hand hezekiah has a very different attitude and god does a mighty miracle for hezekiah okay so we see all of these details i you know happening and uh, this is mentioned in your i you know in isaiah 36 to uh, 37 all right there is absolutely no time for even one sentence more uh, i really hope nobody has doubts we have no time for doubts let's just close with a word of prayer Lord we just thank you so much for the amazing things that we can learn from your word every time we open it thank you oh lord for for putting down the stories of all of these people so that we can learn from their lives so that we can have a better more secure faith filled 
uh, relationship with you, O oh Lord. Help us not to be foolish like Ahaz, O oh Lord, but rather help us to be people like Hezekiah, who are willing to depend on you, trust in you, and see amazing miracles being done on our behalf. I pray, O oh Lord, uh, that um, uh, we would be like Isaiah, who was willing to withstand a lot of opposition from the royal court, and he continued to warn the nation um, against making foreign, foreign alliances. Lord, we pray that we would be loyal like Isaiah, rather than looking to please humans. We would be willing to place our eyes on you and choose to please you alone, O oh Lord, in all our life's choices. Lord, we just ask all of this in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for paying attention. And thank you to all of you who are online.